Uh, Francine Jackson will be our first presenter. Francine, if you're, are you ready? Excellent. It is that early. It's actually 23 seconds late. Um, but we will, we will catch back up. I have no, no worries. Well, uh, please use the microphone so that our remote audiences can, oh, can hear, right. and for the uh, archival recordings. Good. If you haven't read this book, this is kind of like an inspiration, if you will. One of the things that I know all of us try to wonder is when we actually do a presentation, do people listen? <laughs> you know, do people actually walk out of the room and get something out of it? Um, Frank Kovac did. When he was a kid, his dad used to take him for many trips to the Adler Planetarium, and he was so inspired by that, he, his goal was to have his own planetarium. And in fact, when, when he would go home as a kid, he'd put stars all over the ceilings and walls. Do you all do that? Mm -hmm. But he wanted more. And fortunately, when he, was, when he was older, he realized that he was very good with his hands. And with that, he decided he wanted to actually make his own planetarium. And I don't know if any of you, I guess not, you haven't been there up in Rhinelander, Wisconsin, anybody? It's an absolutely beautiful facility. It is so good that, and I, I apologize for this next slide. I couldn't find a real picture. So this is actually the back of his book. <laughs> but this, the state of Wisconsin actually gave him their own street sign, his own street sign. And he's actually listed in some of the tourist guides as one of the best man-made tourism places to stop in the state itself. It took him over a decade to make, by himself, by the way. He had a little help with the electricity, but other than that, it took him over a decade, costing over $100,000 of his own money and this is it. Now, this, I, I love this picture because when we visited him, it was snowing like crazy. We couldn't find anything. A few minutes later, we went outside and look at the sky he has. Absolutely beautiful. But here is his dome. The, d the dome is 22 feet wide. It happens to be the, the largest rotatable dome in the world, even bigger than the Atwood sphere. If some of you have seen that. It's actually curved plywood, and it's absolutely unbelievable the way it rotates. I'll show you the mechanism in a minute here. He named it after his dad, who really pushed him and gave him the inspiration for doing this. Here's, here's Frank behind, once again, the console that he designed himself a little better picture of it here. And now his sky. Let me tell you, first of all, his sky, he painted, literally, hence the name of the book, he painted the sky with day-glow paint. It may not be that easy to see, but he made 5,000 stars. And what he does is when he introduces people, he has them uh, you know, talk for a few minutes to get the light. And by the time the lights go down, these lights come up, these, the stars come up. And he's constantly working on them just to make sure that they look exactly like the sky that he sees outside. It's absolutely unbelievable when you, when you see it. And this is how the dome rotates. And I have to read this because you could have seen me 
trying to not help these poor people put this in. You know, I'm, I don't do machines. Uh, the dome is rotated by a one-half horsepower DC gear motor powered from a variable speed control box. The entire planetarium globe is supported by two steel pivoting support arms with four 10-inch polyurethane wheels at a 45-degree angle, which happens to be very close to his latitude, along with the top-bearing spring support tied into the main building structure. I have no idea what I just read, but he didn't. He made it himself. You know, unbelievable guy. And the entire planetarium weighs about two tons, all done by himself. Again, very, very little help. This thing is absolutely amazing, but unfortunately, he couldn't keep it up. It just, the number of people that were coming couldn't, su couldn't support the, the workmanship and the, the monies that he owed, his mortgage payment. Was a, so unfortunately, at this moment, the Kovac Planetarium is closed, probably for good. And he's had to go back to work full time and overtime in the paper mill just to pay back his bills. You know, just would be really wonderful if people, you know, if something could be done to have him reopen. It would just be unbelievable. He did have a GoFundMe page, but not too many people, I guess, knew about it and gave him anything. And just, just as an aside, to tell you how, once I heard about this, how we really wanted to see it. You know, most of you know I live in Rhode Island, which is kind of small. But because of this, people have a driving mentality to the point where, for instance, I don't know if some of you know, I worked, I worked for 20 years in what started out as a dog track, and now is actually a major casino in, the, you know, in, in Rhode Island, just a couple miles from my house in Lincoln. A lot of my fellow employees are from Woonsocket, which is about five miles north. Most of them have never been south of Lincoln, south of the casino, because that's an awfully far distance. In fact, most of them have never driven the next five miles south to Providence. It's too far. Well, to give you a feel, I had to travel five Rhode Islands from Midway <laughs> to get there. And believe it or not, it was worth it. We thought that we'd have maybe an hour or two with him. We were with him for four and a half hours and could have stayed forever. I mean, just unbelievable guy. So thank you. I just wanted, I just thought if any of you had any, yeah, had any inkling to come, he's, I think he'd be more than willing to show it to you. And if anybody has any questions on my quickie thing, thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Francine. We have a question up front here from Jeannie. I uh, have uh, two things. First of all, did he use ultraviolet light then to, for his day glow stars in the planetarium to illuminate that now, sky? No, he would just turn, he would, he would just have the lights on, and when, um, when the show started, the lights would go off, the stars would stay on. And how long was his show, did he say? About an hour. And the, the, the day glow lasted for that length of yes, time? Yes. I can just imagine, though, under ultraviolet, that would have, have enhanced it so much. And the second thing I was wondering, had he applied to the city, who gave him a name for a road, uh, it seems to me that they would be proud of him and want to support him with money. They were proud to give him a sign. <laughs> and remember, it's in his driveway. You know, it's in, on his property, so it's in his driveway. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks so much. Any more questions for Francine? Thank all you right. all for listening. Thank you very much, Francine. And uh, short aside, it, it really is a fantastic book. You can find it on Amazon really inexpensively. So I, I, would, I would recommend it as well. All right, uh, up next we have a presentation from Martin Ratcliffe, who is, if you look around the room, you may notice is not here, uh, but it will be presented for us today by Bart Benjamin. Good morning, all. Um, obviously, I'm not Martin Ratcliffe. 
Uh, but uh, he was unable to be here for the conference, and uh, he asked me to present his paper. And uh, this is basically a paper that combines South Africa with science history, observational astronomy, the planet Mars, and 21st century astrophotography, all in one paper. Our story starts with one of the two observatories that Martin visited this past summer, the Boyden Observatory in South Africa. Both of these are in the city of Bloemfontein, which is Dutch for Fountain of Flowers, although there's some dispute as to why it's called that. That's its name. This uh, first observatory, the Boyden, Boyden houses a 13-inch Clark refractor which dates back to the late 1880s, thereby predating the famous Lowell 24-inch Alvin Clark refractor. William Pickering, the director of the Harvard Observatory, purchased this using funds from uh, a Draper Fund. And originally, it was uh, outfitted in Arequipa, Peru. But uh, in about 1927, I believe, it was relocated to South Africa. This is the 13-inch Clark refractor today. And Martin had a personal goal to view Mars at its perihelic opposition, which of course happens every 17 or 18 years, from the southern hemisphere. And of course, the reason for that, most of us know, as uh, astronomers that when uh, it is at its perihelic opposition, it's very far south. So for us here in the northerners, it's low in the sky. But from South Africa, it's very high. And that gave him a unique opportunity to observe Mars and to take some 21st century photographs of Mars using a 19th century telescope. And that's Martin there beside the telescope. This 13-inch uh, uh, refractor, Alvin Clark refractor, it has a uh, history of its own. It was the first telescope ever to take black and white photographs of Mars. And these are actually glass plates, and they have multiple images of Mars on each plate. So Martin is there holding one of the glass plates that dates from June of 1888. Okay, the other observatory is uh, called the Lamont Hussey Observatory, and its benefactor, its benefactor organization, has a Michigan connection, specifically the University of Michigan. And oh, this whole, and uh, this is the uh, actual camera that uh, was used to take uh, the first color photographs of Mars in the late 1930s by a man named uh, Earl Slifer at the Lamont Hussey Observatory. And Martin was able to find this particular image which uh, combines the historic photograph with the appearance of the uh, camera today. The plates would have been held back here and they would literally move the plate to a different position to get yet another image of Mars uh, exposed on a different part of that plate. And like all color photographs, it's really a, a combination of three photographs. Even color film worked that way. And your TV works that way, too. That was the case back then. They used, of course, glass plates taken in red, green, and blue and combined them. And this was... Uh, uh, one of the first images, color photographs of Mars using the 27 and a half inch telescope. The 27 inch telescope was dismantled in the 1970s, but pieces of it were found, refurbished, and uh, are being re exhibited at the front of the observatory. 
This is, of course, Martin posing next to the uh, original telescope tube. They're in the process of mounting it more permanently when this picture was taken. And there's another Michigan connection because the original 27-inch lens from this telescope uh, is uh, at the University of Michigan. And this shows uh, uh, Patrick Seitzer of the University of Michigan with the director of the Boyden Observatory, Mady Hoffman, posing with that magnificent piece of glass used for so many years to image so many objects. There are a few of the uh, classic photographs taken comparing Flagstaff images of the Lowell Observatory to those of the South Af African Telescope. Okay, this leads us more to Martin's recent adventure and his desire to mate 19th century technology with 21st century technology. Martin brought his advanced video camera to the telescope to capture video frames, which then he stacked and processed to create images of Mars that are far better than what professional observatories could do 20, 30, 40 years ago, and certainly better than what was done in the late 1800s. Unfortunately, Mars experienced, or uh, Martin experienced a, uh, a setback, not of his own making, in that Mars decided to uh, have a dust storm uh, starting in uh, mid-June and going through most of July, which did hinder his uh, abilities to get the best possible images Martin still worked hard to do it and got some great images nonetheless. He used a digital camera, the ZWO ASI 178 millimeter, which attached to it. He used RGB and infrared filters to capture frames. And then he used a couple of different software packages to uh, stack them, arrange them, uh, and to correct for their rotation. One thing that I didn't know is that, is that uh, with each of the filters, you need to completely uh, refocus for that particular color. And, uh, and it caused some serious problems with his hands because uh, these old telescopes are not easy to adjust. Uh, they're very tight and uh, cumbersome. And combined with the cold temperatures, because it was winter down there during our summer, uh, it caused some fatigue. But he soldiered through and got images nonetheless. Okay, now the good stuff. Um, one advantage of having someone else uh, do your, read your paper for you is that you can gush about the, the images and not worry about losing your humility. These are just great images. Uh, uh, I've been associated with Martin for a while uh, because we both are doing astrophotography these days. I'm much more a beginner than he. And uh, these are just great images. Uh, for those of you who don't know the basic process, you, get, you, you basically acquire hundreds and hundreds of still images, usually through video. So you're taking video, and then you're taking all those hundreds of images and, and digitally stacking them to correct noise and to correct the seeing, because of course we all look through a swimming pool of air. And, uh, People who train their eyes to see things, to see detail at an eyepiece, learn that they need to be patient and wait for those moments of clarity when all of a sudden the details pop out. And for an instant, you see what you hope to see, but 80% of the time you can't see because of our atmosphere. Well, the same thing is done here, except it's the camera that's seeing it instead of your retina. So uh, he captured all these images throws out the bad ones, keeps the good ones, stacks them, and then processes them. And as you can see, amazing detail comes out. And this is during the dust storm. So if there were no dust storm, this would be even better than this. But we get the north polar hood. We get the south polar cap. And this is what has really impressed me. Olympus Mons actually poked its head out of the dust, much like the Empire State Building or the Sears Tower pokes out of the brown fog 
in Chicago and New York, and he got that. So, very impressive. When he returned to the USA, he of course has his own telescope that he uses to collect his own images from uh, Kansas and wherever he might travel to. And using a Celestron 14, he obtained images later, which were even better than what he was able to get at South Africa, because, because by then, the dust had settled a little bit. And you can see, and you can also see the differences between recording in red light, green light, blue light, and infrared light. And uh, you can see that the detail was really starting to pop out of the Martian features. And pick up a book sometime, an astronomy book that was written in the 1960s, 70s, or 80s, and look at the best pictures of Mars that they usually put in those textbooks. And I think you'll appreciate how much better an amateur astronomer can do today compared to what the best observatories of the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and probably even 80s were able to do. It's really an impressive field, and it's something that uh, I think we planetarians could probably benefit from to kind of keep up with what is going on in the, in the amateur astronomy world because some really exciting things are happening with uh, imaging. And this, of course, is a beauty shot taken of the classic Boyden 13-inch refractor and the planet Mars. And you can see, don't you wish Mars would have been that high for us? That's why he went to the Southern Hemisphere, because it was high, the atmosphere was not as big a factor, and he got some wonderful images as a result. And of course, being the dutiful scientist, he didn't just save these to his laptop and move on. He submitted them so that they, so that his images could be combined with the images of many other people throughout the world of this perihelic opposition 2018. He sent all his images and notes to the uh, British Astronomical Association, thereby improving our collective knowledge of Mars during this very favorable opposition. OK, you can see the uh, Silver Dome uh, way up there, very small. Oh, this thing has a bigger point. Right there. And uh, some of the colleagues that he met while he was there, Pat Seitzer, uh, his wife, Mady Hoffman, and just, I guess, to remind us this isn't Kansas anymore, a visitor nearby, the giraffe, and the observatory reminds us that this is indeed South Africa, beautiful country with beautiful landscapes, beautiful wildlife, wildlife beautiful skies, and of course the southern hemisphere skies that we northerners covet and wish to visit someday if we haven't already. more pictures of the observatory, the huge dome rotation wheels. These things were built. And the more you read about astronomical history and science history, you really appreciate the amount of work that was done to move an observatory and the thought of moving from a observatory from Peru to South Africa and building. Uh, very impressive. Even harder uh, back in the 1800s than it would be today. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to mention that the, uh, that the, uh, what's it called? The Lamont Hussey Observatory, I mentioned it was closed in 1972, but after that, or much more recently, it became the first digital planetarium in sub-Saharan Africa and op reopened uh, as, a, as a planetarium in November of 2013. So the dome continues in a different aspect, but uh, it continues to serve the public and serve the astronomical community in a different way as a planetarium. And of course, another beauty shot, Mars, Milky Way, 
need I say more? Beautiful imaging. So. Bart, you are now into, you are now into your two-minute oh, question period. Perfect, because I'm also at my last slide. OK, so a few acknowledgments. He was gracious enough to thank me for uh, reading his paper. And uh, I encourage you to uh, contact Martin if you have any questions, if you want to know more about his adventures, his imaging techniques, all of that. Uh, he's the one to ask. And if you ever want to enter the, uh, the hobby of uh, astronomical imaging, astrophotography, he's a really good resource to get you started. So please contact him. He's very helpful, and he knows a heck of a lot about the subject by doing it. So with that, I thank you very much, and uh, I guess I can try to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Questions for Bart? Not knowing anything about astrophotography, um, I'm wondering how long these video clips are. As long as you can get them. <laughs> Uh, another thing, you, what, you need several things to do this well. You need a, a telescope with a really good clock drive because you want that image to basically stay in the same spot. So you really need a good clock drive and good polar alignment to keep that clock drive, uh, where it, to keep the image where it should be. Uh, but uh, when I first started, I, I stacked maybe 200 images and, and uh, Martin commented to me that you need to probably do a little bit more than that. So some people st are stacking 800. 1,000, 1,200. So really, you can almost stack as many as you want. Obviously, it takes longer to acquire all those images, but with, with the specialized cameras that he uses and some of the more advanced amateur astronomers use that are very task-specific to this, they can capture a lot of images in a short time. So I just use a, a, an off-the-shelf camera to do it. I can probably you know, get 10 or 15 frames a second, with these things you can get significantly more and thereby acquire significantly more frames to stack in a given time slot. All right, um, quick question? We'll see how quickly it can be answered. So right now when I do astrophotography, I, I stack images, but they're like the darks, the flats, they're stills. I haven't tried video before. So if I'm going to get into that, Again, I guess, how long of a video would you recommend? Uh, is it something I can do with just an off-the-shelf Canon ADD? Or is there something more specific that I'm going to have to do to start pulling images from? And do you have to do darks and flats and stuff with video? I don't. That's a dumb question. Uh, but. Yeah, but, but you can. But basically, when you talk about video, what you really want are lots of still frames. So what you really are trying to get are still frames. Video is just a series of still frames. Uh, classic video is 30 frames per second. So basically, you're getting 30 frames a second. And then with software, you can, you can transform what we normally think of as, as a moving video file to just a series of several hundred fr still frames. So really, video is just a, an easier way to capture many, many still frames. And you can do that with, I have a micro four thirds camera. You can do that with a digital single lens reflex. Any camera today, I think any camera today, can take video, HD usually, and some of the newer ones are coming out with 4K video. Uh, and uh, the advantage of that, as long as your exposures can be short enough, because you're limited to 1 30th of a second with video. So if you need, if, if your object is too dim and you need a quarter second or an eighth of a second, then you need to take still frames and stack them. But uh, if you're Optical system is such that you can do a 30th of a second or faster, then video works great because you just set the video, record, 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 and then later on you deal with it at the computer. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Bart, and uh, Martin as well. That's going to wrap up our time for that one. All right, uh, up next we have from the Michigan Science Center, Paula Epstein for the first of two presentations. Sorry, y'all are gonna have to listen to me for like 20 minutes speaking. Hi, guys. 
Um, so as he said, I'm Paulette Epstein. I'm from the Michigan Science Center. I am the director of museum learning there. So um, I actually oversee all of our internal programming at the Michigan Science Center. Uh, and one thing that we are uh, working on right now is actually sort of uh, evaluating our programming and coming up with a way to do that. So for the past uh, five years, the Michigan Science Center is actually coming up on its sixth birthday. Uh, we have really not done much evaluation. Uh, we have sent out some surveys, and in those surveys, uh, we have learned a couple of things. The kids have fun, and they like the food. Like, that's all we've learned from our surveys uh, at this point because we haven't really looked into what we're trying to actually learn. Um, and we, ha we don't, haven't really come up with our long-term objectives of what our programming is sort of about. Um, so this year, I have been working uh, on a project to actually come up with, we call them core critical impact indicators. So those are basically when you talk about the evaluation process and evaluation in general, these are the long-term outcomes that we are trying to achieve with our programming. Um, specifically, uh, this was funded by Denso, um, and actually it's because of their funding that I was able to come, uh, which I really do appreciate. Uh, all that they have done for us. Um, and so with that funding, uh, I've been able to spend some of my time working on these core critical impact indicators for the past year. Now, I don't particularly actually have a background in evaluation. Um, I have a background in planetariums. I've been working in the field. Uh, I started in 2009 uh, at the uh, at UW Stevens Point. That was actually my first conference in Bay City. Uh, and then I uh, moved on to the Broward College Bueller Planetarium, and I was I was there for a little bit. Uh, and then I was at the Adler in Chicago, but I was just a presenter there. Um, and so this has been, uh, I've been at the Michigan Science Center for about three and a half years, and I've moved up uh, pretty quickly. And so uh, I went from just being a planetarium person to uh, having to uh, create curriculum um, outside of the planetarium in areas that I'm not necessarily familiar with, um, and also uh, evaluating programs that um, needed, needed this evaluation. Um, so uh, this is a project, like I said, that we have been working on. We did uh, end up uh, getting another grant, um, STEM 2035, uh, which is based uh, upstate New York, and um, I forget what the foundation is, but ups they, they fund projects in upstate New York and in the southeast Michigan area, um, so the Detroit area, and they fund programs uh, to, again, uh, underserved communities. Um, Detroit is one of the most diverse cities uh, in most, it is one of the most diverse cities. We have a, a very large African American population. We're actually 80% African American in our city, um, so, which is different than most other cities that you would go to. Um, and we also have a heavy Muslim population and Jewish population and Mexican population. And so um, we are a very, very diverse area, uh, and that's why we got that funding. But, be, uh, but with that funding, we are actually able to um, we were able to join something called the Pear Institute, which is out of Harvard, um, and they will actually help us to develop uh, even more of our core critical impact indicators. Um, and so at, basically at this point, uh, I've been able to do a lot of research, but we haven't really come up with too terribly much uh, about evaluating our programs. Um, and we, we'd like to develop those long-term outcomes and then, of course, work backward from there. Um, but part of the reason that I am doing this paper today um, is that I actually want to hear from you guys. Um, and I want to sort of turn this into a little bit of a discussion. Um, and I want to hear, like, how do you evaluate your programs? What may your long-term outcomes be um, for your programs? Because this is part of my research and data collection is to talk to folks in the field. And I figured a paper was a great way to do that. And if you want to hear more about, like, the process that we've gone through and some of the strands and stuff like that, um, so far you can read my paper. Um, but uh, I figure... We've got two mediums here, may as well use them. So uh, is, does anyone want to share uh, how you guys evaluate your programs at, at your institution, in your planetarium, anything? Bueller? Bueller? <laughs> so um, at the St. Louis Science Center, we have what we call SAMI cards. Um, and it's, I'm 
probably going to embarrass myself and get it wrong. It's like sys system analysis uh, mi for mission impact or so something along those lines. But there's basically four questions that get asked, and you can rate them from one to four, one being the worst, four being the best. Um, and there are things like, um, did you get anything out of this program? Did this program make you like science? Did you learn anything from this program? And then there's two open-ended questions on it as well. Um, and one of them is a more specific, what did you get out of this program? And then a, how could we make this program better? Um, and then there's some demographic stuff we ask them to fill out at the bottom as well. Uh, the top part, of course, is so that we can kind of see things in a chart. And then the bottom part is for us to hopefully learn things to improve upon. We struggle with getting people to fill those out, however, at least in the planetarium, um, because they also can look around at exhibits after, and they have only a very short period of time to do that, and so they don't want to spend their time filling out cards. Um, but we try to beg them to do it, and sometimes they do. Um, and then sometimes, like you, we get answers like, how could you make the show better? Peanut butter and a goat. So, uh, which was one of my favorites. Um, so there, it's a little open-ended, there's not necessarily, the only time we can really get good core groups is when we do our field trip packages because we have them kind of at our mercy in a classroom and we can ask them to fill it out and then we can also get teacher feedback and student feedback that way. And those ones are a little bit longer and they also ask how was the ease of booking your field trip package and that kind of thing as well. Um, and then we also have um, white cards that get randomly passed out by um, some of our uh, evaluators just on, at random times throughout the day, and those ones get mailed back in, and they can be rated one through four, and you have an option of giving an open-ended answer too. So we have a few different forms that get filled out, and then we look at all of those and kind of compare against every year, what were we at in previous years this month, what were we at at a whole overall last year, in the last five years, that kind of thing. Um, and it kind of helps us to see trends and people feel this way about us at this time, or. Um, and we can also compare it against weather data because with the zoo really close to us, uh, we are in direct competition with weather and them. So if it rains, they like us. If it's sunny, they like the zoo. So um, we can kind of look at all of that and see some correlations. But um, like you said, it's, it's not always easy to get them to give you the answers that you hope to get. Yeah, it's, it's not always easy to get those answers. And the other thing is like, when you ask someone retrospectively, like, did you learn something? Um, we find that the answers that we're getting um, aren't necessarily true answers. And so that's part of the reason why we're in the Pear Institute is to, to we're actually working with sociologists um, to get more uh, sort of insight into how people think so that we can potentially end up with more, uh, more insightful data. Um, and it's been, it's been really tricky because uh, a lot of the evaluation stuff that exists, exists for the, um, the, f the formal environment. Uh, so if you are a classroom teacher and you see the kids every day for a semester, or for the year, like it's much easier to see their growth over time where most of us in here maybe see the kids one, like one time and we may never see them again. Um, and so how do we get some of that same information out of that we're, that we're learning from the schools and comparing the formal and the informal um, institutions? And so I'm hoping uh, the Pear Institute uh, helps us to do that. I think Jeannie's got to. You are close with the schools then. You can uh, be in touch with them. I think a big thing is to be in touch with those teachers who bring those classes, not just filling out cards for particular moment after the show, that when they go back, and if you could have some um, question indicators that the teachers would apply to see, number one, if they liked it, or two, if they learned anything. There are two dimensions there. There's the, the um, inspirational aspect, the motivational aspect, the, the liking aspect, and then there's the learning aspect. And if you could have indicators on both dimensions, if you're trying to, to learn that, and have the teachers do it, it's fine. And there's an informal thing that you can note. It has nothing to do with their uh, filling something out. Um, just as they leave, note the expressions on their face. Note if they thank you. Note if they say, gee, that was great, wow. You know, those are, those are things that are good indicators too, besides the written word, I think. 
Yeah, there's there's actually a couple of different ways to do the evaluation process. One of them is to, to do the surveys and the cards and everything like that. Um, another way is to do observations. So you, you watch people while they're interacting with exhibits. You watch people while they're um, coming out of the show, uh, all of that. Um, and you, you make those observations and you have specific questions that you answer with those. Um, and then there's the beam pole surveys. So like as people are leaving the planetarium, if you, we've actually thought about making a little kiosk with buttons like one through five. And it's like, how much, have you, how much did you like the show? Um, or something like that. So you get a quick response and actually you're more likely to get a response um, than having to fill out those survey cards. Um, and so there's, it, as long as you're sort of hitting several different areas. There's also the follow-up surveys that are online, um, and that's actually something that we've looked at doing because the, um, yeah, we've looked at doing the, the follow-up surveys online because we have a CRM, so that's really great, customer relations uh, management software. Um, and so when people buy tickets, we have all of their information and we can actually automatically send them emails. Although, that might be an issue moving forward with <laughs> um, some of the, uh, <laughs> Uh, laws around the um, privacy uh, and information uh, in Europe, um, and we'll see what happens in the United States moving forward. But um, so we've we've thought about automatically sending out surveys, but our CRM is not able to do that, unfortunately. So we have it, but we're just not able to use it. Um, and then, um, yeah. So it's, yeah, and I think I'm almost out of time. But does anyone else have any? Comments, questions, concerns? Because I'm just eating into my own time, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm curious, so I know you have the, the school that's attached to the Science Center, and I'm wondering, would it be possible or within the scope of the project to maybe pick a teacher or two at the same level or varying levels and do um, pre, during, and post activities with them and have them do assessors as well to get feedback? So we've thought about it and we've done stuff like that in the past. Um, it depends on the teachers that are there. It depends on the administration that they have at the time. Um, right now, they are a Detroit Public School Community District School. Um, they were a charter school. Um, before I think last year and so like when they were a charter school it was much easier to do stuff like that but now that they're part of the Detroit community or Detroit Public School Community District um, it's a little bit harder though we do work very closely with the Detroit Public School Community District um, we, we actually have uh, grade level initiatives where we bring all, I think this year we're actually working on bringing all of the first graders um, in the Detroit public schools. We've done seventh, we've done fourth, we've done and brought them in uh, to prep them for testing, all of that stuff. Um, the problem that we find is like administration is super on board, so they have a, a, an office of science, um, but the teachers are a little bit harder to get on board because they're in the classrooms, they're doing the teaching, they have to get to all of these different things, and they have a much harder, like, harder time trying to fit it in, um, and the administration doesn't quite get that. So we've had to work with both the teachers and the administration um, to figure out how we how we do that in the future. And we did M-STEP programming, so that's the, um, the, the state testing in uh, Michigan, and with the M-STEP programming, we uh, were actually able to um, see a little bit of a change. The Detroit Public Schools actually did a little bit better on their M-STEP than they did the year before when we were doing that prep programming. Um, but it's still not good enough because uh, um, Michigan is, is not particularly good with their uh, uh, state testing, so especially in math and science and, and literacy too. So we've got to try and figure out how to integrate literacy into our science curriculums that we do. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Paulette. Uh, up next from the Michigan Science Center, I'd like to introduce Paulette Epstein. Hi, guys. Uh, so, I'm, 
So another project that I worked on last year, this was also grant funded thanks to the uh, Michigan Space Grant Consortium. Uh, the Michigan Space Grant Consortium is the Michigan sort of local thing that we reach out to to get funding through, uh, to, that we reach out to to get NASA funding basically. Um, so they fund programs anywhere from $5,000 to $20,000 um, and most of those programs are outreach specific. Um, so uh, the one that we did uh, was, and, and by outreach, I mean not in the classroom. So if they're coming to the Science Center, that counts as outreach. Um, if they uh, are actually just working with kids in general, um, so NASA's outreach and our, our outreach is a little bit different. We do have an outreach program um, where we uh, go out to schools and we do programs. Um, and actually, that's what we did with this one. Um, so this is the uh, Red Planet Pioneers Mission to Mars. Uh, and with this program, it was an after-school program that we piloted with one of the uh, local schools. So um, they, we, has anyone heard of the Young Astronauts Program from the Reagan era? Okay. Um, so the school that we partnered with was actually still doing the red or the the young astronauts program up until not last year but the year before and the teacher that was doing that program was getting ready to retire and we actually happened to be part of that program we went and did a an outreach with them um, and did one of the lessons that they do uh, they, they do six lessons um, throughout the year, so one a month, basically, and then we have to skip a couple of months in there because of, you know, you can't start it in September with an after-school program because the kids aren't ready for that yet. And um, and then uh, we end it in May, actually. So uh, it was a, like I said, uh, six six lessons. We taught one of them um, the year before we took, kind of took it over, and the, the teacher came to us and was like, I'm getting ready to retire. And she wanted us to help to continue that program. Um, so we applied for funding and we got it. Uh, and we actually worked with the school to create this after school program because um, the, though the Young Astronauts program is fantastic, um, it was a little out of date. Um, and we wanted to sort of beef it up a little bit. And we actually decided that we were going to focus on Mars. Um, and that's what that's what we were doing. So each of these lessons that we did, which, there we go. Um, each of these lessons that we did, we actually like focused on a Mars or a Martian topic. Um, so we have, let's see, uh, gravity. We were teaching teaching the fundamentals of gravity, why gravity is important, and how uh, gravity affects our trip to Mars. Um, so we started by teaching the fundamentals, and then we talked about the human experience, launching and landing, because that is very important for us to get to Mars, uh, and protecting the astronauts. We talked about radiation, stuff like that. Um, and we also talked about rovers and geology. Um, on Mars. So we were trying to fit in the things that they were learning in the classroom um, and because we actually get a chart from the school districts in the area of what they're learning when. Um, so we tried to actually fit that into what we were teaching in the after school program so that they could uh, they could make that connection of what they're learning in the classroom to what they might see um, in someplace else and just make those two connections. Um, so we have this, this was our uh, schedule. We did actually, for the potluck at the end, take Star Lab. We have a, a uh, we have the old Star Lab uh, with our cylinders. Um, though we did find out that maybe setting it up in a gym, when you're having the potluck in that gym, <laughs> found that that's probably not a good idea. Um, and we also had these kids were really, really excited, really excited. Um, we were working with a school that. I didn't bring my sticky note with me. Um, we we were working with a school that had um, some. They were they were part of that underserved uh, area. Detroit is a fairly Im impoverished area for the most part. So us working with underserved kids is not particularly hard. Um, it's basically all we do. Um, but the uh, we worked with 64 third through fifth graders. Um, and we actually had the, the school demographics are 96.4% African American, um, and 55.1% uh, of the school is on free and reduced lunch. 
So um, we also had 30% of our program that were female, and that was really exciting um, to see those, those girls in the room. And actually, the girls were awesome and better than the boys. They understood. They they were they, um, one they were a little better behaved, um, and two, uh, they were able to pick up the concepts a lot faster. And so um, we did have a couple of kids uh, that really really excelled in the program, and that was really exciting. Um, but uh, we had a couple, we had a couple that they were there and they were having a great time. But again, this is why we need evaluation. We don't know exactly how much. They got out of that program. Um, so we uh, we did lots of really cool, awesome things. Um, you can see some of our kids in the classroom. Uh, we did hands-on activities for basically everything that we did. Uh, the programs were an hour and a half. Um, so it was actually a two-hour program, but they had snack time built into that as well. We provided the snacks for them, uh, thanks to the grant funding that we were able to get. Uh, and um, so we made sure everybody was fed and everybody was uh, had water. And we, we made sure to try and fulfill um, some of those Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, so we made sure that they were fed. We made sure that they, were, uh, they felt safe, all of that, um, because without that, then they can't reach sort of that um, enlightenment. Uh, so uh, the kids, like I said, they had a, had a really great time. These were the fourth graders. The fourth graders were actually the ones that I taught in the, in the classroom. We had originally made this program so that we would only see 25 kids, third through fifth grade, like all three grade levels in the same classroom. Um, and so we were gonna have, you know, one teacher, and then I would be there to help facilitate if needed and also uh, be there to report out on the grant and all of that stuff. Um, it ended up that that wasn't what the school wanted. They wanted something a little bit more. So we uh, ended up doing uh, 25 third graders, 25 fourth graders, 25 fifth graders. Um, we didn't end up filling all of those sessions, um, but uh, so then we needed three teachers. Uh, and at that point, I was like, well, I guess I'm going to be teaching um, the, all of the lessons, which actually worked out because most of the lessons I was, a, I was actually piloting. Like, some of the lessons already existed, but some of them I had to write um, and then try to teach them. And then now I'm actually working on going back and fixing them because I, I learned some things that, that, weren't, uh, that did not work. And I think that's a big part of teaching is like being able to go back to your lessons going, that didn't work, we gotta fix this, um, and, and piloting it and, and moving forward. Um, and so I actually, I actually wrote lessons for all of these. Um, part of it was, was um, using lessons that did already exist, but um, so I did use some NASA curriculum with gaining traction on Mars, all of that stuff. Um, but uh, a lot of it was, was still writing, and I'm still working on them. Um, but uh, these lessons will actually be available um, for anyone who wants them. Uh, so if you're interested in seeing what the lessons look like, what our curriculum look like, um, you can reach out to me, and I can um, send it your way when I finish it. <laughs> Hopefully in the in the semi near future, uh, because I think I'm at MSTA, I'm going to have to give out those lessons and yeah, okay. <laughs> I'm going to ask my staff for help at this point. Um, so this was the third grade classroom, um, and I think I forget what activity they were doing um, in there. No, I, that's the that's the carpet in the classroom. Um, so one of our last lessons uh, we ended up doing, we, uh, we, so our annual gala this year was space themed. If anybody saw my dress yesterday, I made that dress for our annual gala. Um, and uh, we had this really great idea for centerpieces for our annual gala. We had a great idea that we were gonna have kids decorate the, the um, fish bowls. And we were, they were going to decorate them, and then they were going to create a planet. And uh, we were, then we were like, well, we can do this in our Spark Lab space. And then we're like, no, this is really messy. We don't want this in the only carpeted space that we have in the museum. Um, and we were like, well, maybe we can bring some kids in and do it. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm doing an after-school program, so we're just going to do it with them. Um, and this is them... <laughs> painting the, the inside of the, the fish bowls. Um, 
the company that gave us the stuff to decorate them, for some reason, gave us oil-based paint, which I really appreciate. Um, yeah, I had a few words with them after that, and I had no idea they were oil-based until I got there, and then they were already painting, and um, the, luckily, this child's mother had a really great sense of humor. <laughs> um, so uh, he was covered in paint, and he was, he was a little concerned because it was not washing off. It was not washing off, and I was like, no, 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 it's okay. It'll, it'll come off in a week or so. <laughs> It just might take a while. Um, but it was actually a really great activity, and then we were able to share that with our donors um, and at our annual gala. And uh, the kids came up with some really, really creative ideas. Um, and we also had um, our end of year thing. Um, this was uh, at the picnic or the, the uh, thing that we had. And so we, we gave them all the awards and they had a really great time. We really, we really impacted these kids. Um, I, I feel, and it was really exciting. Uh, the best part of the whole thing was that the fifth graders got to make rockets. So at the end of the year, this was not one of the, the sessions, at the end of the year, they got to launch the rockets. Uh, we worked with our local 4-H um, and were able to, to launch them and it was a lot of fun. Uh, everybody's rocket went up, nobody's rocket exploded on the platform, which is better than the Boy Scouts that I used to teach uh, when I was at UW Students Point. Um, so we had, um, we had a really great time with this program, um, and uh, um, unfortunately, after the funding uh, ran out for the one year, um, we were not able to continue the program at that school, um, but we do have the materials so that they can teach volunteers and stuff like that to facilitate that programming in the future, um, but they just need somebody who's willing to, to pick that up. Um, and I think that's all of my time. But uh, here's my information. If you guys want uh, more information, if you have questions, anything like that, uh, feel free to email me. Um, I also have business cards if anybody would like them. Um, and yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Paulette. All right. Well, we are down to the final presentation in paper session 3B. Our presenter will be Nick Hoffman from Clark Planetarium in Salt Lake City. Uh, AKA Glippo West. This is why we allow three minutes for changeover between presentations. Is this the mic to use? Okay, we're gonna raise this up just a little bit. All right, so hopefully last but not least, um, I'll probably go relatively quickly since we are the very last presenter. Uh, so my name is Nick Hoffman. I'm at the Clark Planetarium and I work in the education department. And I wanna give you guys a version of a presentation that was done at the CEPAWAC conference. This was done by my supervisor, my boss. He was in charge of a big renovation project and I wanted to tell you guys about that project. There were a lot of changes and updates to our exhibits. Uh, and then tell you about some of the, because that project was several years ago, tell you about some of the results that we've seen in the intervening time. Uh, so, let's see. Maybe yes on the clicker, maybe no. There we go. Uh, so, just some information on our institution. The planetarium was initially founded in 1965 in Salt Lake, it's the Hanson Planetarium back then. Uh, the, uh, over the years, the facility had aged, and in 2003, we moved into a new building, renamed as the Clark Planetarium. Uh, it was a very big project, lots of successes there, um, but that was also 15 years ago now. So over the time since 2003, even in the new facility, there were some issues that had arisen. Um, some major factors had led to a decline in attendance. And so the, the main issues there was there was a growing homelessness problem in Salt Lake City, and we were located pretty close to the shelters, and so some of that was affecting us. 
Um, there was a significant drug problem associated with the homelessness issue in the area. And then just age. It had been a significant number of years. The building was aging. The exhibits were aging. So it was time for, time for some changes. Uh, some additional information as far as just the facility itself. We've got a 55-foot dome theater. We have an IMAX theater that seats 200-some. Uh, we've got a science on a sphere presentation area, and then about 11,000 square feet of exhibit space. Um, attendance had declined significantly. Um, in 2009, approximate annual attendance was about 400,000, and it had dipped into the about 2015 area, 2014, into about 300,000. So there was a significant decline that we were trying to address. Um, some extra background information, the IMAX. The IMAX was a very big deal from 2003 to 2012. Uh, and over the, those, over that period, there had been a number of other IMAX theaters that had been built within the kind of like a 20 mile radius and that led to a decline in ticket sales, which had been a major revenue driver. Um, and of course, membership concessions, those were also tied in to IMAX revenue. Um, there was a brief period where we tried to show Hollywood IMAX movies instead of just the documentary style films, uh, but we actually lost money on that due to the revenue split nature of the agreement. So that was phased out after a couple of years, which I see some nodding heads, so I have the feeling that everybody, other people have tried this as well. Uh, so after about 10 years, the decision was made to do a large exhibit-based renovation. Uh, in addition to just our facility, there are some national trends to take in here. And I pulled some of these stats. I'll mention at the end of my presentation uh, an Aztec webinar that might be worth checking out if you are a member of ASTZ. Uh, in the last 10 years, there are fewer families with children by about 10%, and that's projected to continue in the next few years, down another 5%. So many of us have a primary audience that does include youth, and so that is a significant trend. Fewer families with children, fewer children in general in some, uh, popula in some population centers. Uh, and then there is just some general reduced trust and valuation of science centers. And these are also probably some statistics you may be aware of. And again, I'll reference that webinar again later on. Um, and that stat is just for the United States alone. I'll, I should reference that doesn't include worldwide trends. Uh, so when you're in this situation, what are your options? You can settle for the fact that there are fewer people to visit your institution. Uh, you can update your programs. You can grow, you try to grow your market. Uh, really, just doing nothing is not, not, probably not the best option. Um, if you are in a situation where you can do nothing, that sounds awesome, and I'd love to hear more about your institution, but when you have a significant attendance drop, you want to remedy that as soon as possible. So, I'll tell you a bit about what we ended up doing. Um, back in 2009, when this project was very initial, uh, they started gathering data and looking, doing some research on what we could add to our exhibit-based experiences, what to add to the exhibit floor. Um, moved on to some planning with the stakeholders and starting to raise funding. Um, after the period, up until about 2014, about two-thirds of funding had been raised. Um, rather than struggle to find the additional third of funding on a timeline that wasn't entirely realistic, some staff were repurposed. And so uh, if you guys, if you came by our station and saw the Stellar Playground yesterday, we did repurpose some of our production staff from animation over to game and interactive exhibit development. And so Stellar Playground is just the latest one that they've created, but um, if you've seen any of the other Clark products, you've seen some of their creations, and I would say overall that was a pretty significant success. Um, we did some surveys of audience, both internal and external, and I won't go into all of the data there. It was mostly anecdotal, but there was a lot of useful feedback. Um, and looked at the national trends that we discussed a bit already. IMAX theater attendance was dipping, museum attendance was falling. Uh, I do want to show you at least a little bit of data. We'll get into more of this later. Um, and 2014, we did do an assessment of exhibits. I've got exist listed out here each of our individual exhibit components and the whole time that each one was experiencing in 2009 and 2014. Um, overall, with the uh, inclusion of new exhibits, hold times had dropped. Uh, hold times ever so slightly were up for the museum exhibits as a whole, uh, but individually they were dropping. Um, and so there was definitely the feel that we needed to, we needed to boost those significantly. Um, significant audience research, there was some looking at internal perception as to what staff thought about our mission and about our brand. Um, we looked at the community focus groups and looked at what they wanted us to be and how they viewed us currently. Um, and they definitely viewed us as destination, but we were not the top of mind destination. So there was a, a desire to rebrand and reinvent ourselves to a degree. 
Uh, may, here are some of the more important major requests that came out of that survey. Uh, that more rapidly changing IMAX schedule, as well as the dome. They wanted a larger variety of programming in the dome. Um, more experiences within the building. Uh, they wanted us outside of the building as well. Uh, we are a Salt Lake County facility. We're part of the local government. So we had a lot of opportunities for growth within our target area. Uh, they wanted more interaction with staff. And we made a lot of changes just in response to these that weren't entirely exhibits-based. Uh, we have a more rapidly changing IMAX schedule now. Um, we now open additional dome shows each year to provide more variety in there. Uh, we started having exhibit explainers on the floor. So we've had a lot of strategies to address these. Uh, but I want to talk more about the building, the building renovation. Uh, so overall, the exhibit renovation project was definitely worth it. I want to jump into the, uh, into the data for you in a moment. Um, but anecdotally, energy and excitement were big. Uh, I started at the planetarium about a year ago, so this project kind of started before I was there. Um, but all the feedback I've gotten from staff is that there was a huge burst in just energy and excitement on the, on the museum floor. And I think that the data can tell some of that story. Here's our uh, approximate attendance for the museum in general, for Dome and IMAX theaters over the past couple of years. Uh, this project, the renovation finished in early 2016, the primary phase of the renovation finished in early 2016, and uh, attendance took a jump, took a big jump. There was a big marketing campaign to go along with this, and uh, we did see a significant return. Um, and then IMAX and dome shows have also boosted. And I don't have the 2018 numbers, unfortunately, but uh, I believe the trend continues. We've seen a significant rise in attendance over the past year. Um, it was very promising. Here is the same graphic earlier about exhibit hold times, broken down by exhibit components. Uh, with the renovation that finished in early 2016, there was a significant boost in just the number of possible interactions on the floor. And so you can see the width of the 2017 graph. There's just a larger number of components there. Uh, overall, the individual hold time did increase, though not markedly. Um, we found that one thing that had occurred was that some of the exhibits tended to cannibalize from each other. So some of the most previous, most popular exhibit components were now a little bit less popular. Uh, but overall, the, the whole time for the exhibit space as a whole drastically increased. So this is a breakdown by individual exhibit components, but I'll pull up another graph for you. Uh, this is uh, all of those added together, and I did break them down by our separate floors just because our second floor is relatively small, and I wanted to show that we did put some materials in there that increased whole times. Uh, our third floor is the largest exhibit space we have, so it incre increased the most dramatically. Uh, but from 2014 to 2000, 2017, there was a not quite double, but a significant boost in the amount of time just spent exploring exhibits and interacting there. Uh, and one last set of data that I wanted to show, uh, I was trying to assess what level of demand we experienced in the, the period following the exhibit renovation. And so I wanted to look at school year data. School year bookings typically start in the August, September period, and they tend to jump very dramatically. So here's the cumulative number of booked field trips uh, starting in August. This is just August and September, so I didn't want to go crazy on this. Um, but the exhibit renovation uh, finished in early 2016. So the green line, 2016 to 2017, that would be the school year immediately following the renovation. So there was a dramatic increase in interest and earlier interest. Um, I was looking at this and got confused briefly. I was trying to think, what year was the eclipse again? It feels like it was forever ago. Um, but the purple line, that was probably just around the eclipse time. So lots of interest at that time period as well. Uh, I was intrigued that the exhibit renovation seemed to have a bigger correlation to demand than even the attention that we all received during the eclipse period. So I thought that was interesting. So uh, that's all my data. Um, there is still more, pro there are more projects undergoing. We have a new Department of Community Engagement that focuses on community outreach, has a big presence at the Salt Lake County Libraries as well as does other outreach-based programming to the community off-site. Uh, we've got some new programs coming up in our dome, Dome Lab, which is kind of an art science collaboration with the local arts alliance in our dome theater. And we are using the IMAX theater more as a space not just for IMAX, but for presentations, speakers, performances. So there's lots of other, other projects that are still going on that are still showing some very positive results. Um, I think the community engagement one is probably gonna have the, the most significant drive on attendance curious to see how that goes. Uh, and just to close, I want to mention and reference that webinar. Uh, this was a webinar presented through Aztec a couple years ago. It's definitely worth checking out. It was presented by James Chung. 
Um, lots of really good data and information about disruption, disintermediation, and how people consume data and value science centers. So I do highly recommend that if you are an Aztec member, definitely check that out. Uh, I've watched it several times now. And that is it for me. So which I'm really good. If you saw my timer, the screen is green, which makes me feel pretty good right now. Yeah. Seven seconds left. Perfect timing. <laughs> Thanks so much, Nick. So we do have two minutes for uh, questions. If anybody has questions for Nick yeah, about, happy to try and answer questions on that process if I can. And if not, one of my coworkers has been Clark Longer is here, so I'm just gonna make him do stuff. So um, my facility has a, an IMAX theater and a planetarium as well. Right now, there's pretty big differentiation in that we only have an OptiMechanical, and then our OmniMax is an OmniMax. Mm -hmm. So for you, with what I'm assuming is two digital theaters, how do you create the differentiation between the two so visitors don't think that they're attending the exact same thing? Uh, attending the exact same thing as in what's presented in each? Yeah, confusing the theaters with each other, thinking, oh, I already saw that, but really they only went to one. Well, I guess it's still confusing the theaters with each other, but. Yeah, that's a good question, good question. I'm not sure I've personally encountered much uh, confusion between audiences. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we found is that uh, actually we do very poorly in our IMAX if we bring in astronomy or space-related shows. So our IMAX almost exclusively shows nature films and uh, you know, occasionally things like, uh, like a big popular one we had last year was aircraft carriers and things like that. But things that are very, very distinctly different from what we show in the dome, which is almost entirely space-related shows and, and science and things like that. So um, that's kind of been our method of doing it is just, yeah, our space shows do very poorly in IMAX, so we've, for the most part, stopped doing it um, and just stick with, uh, yeah, basically the nature shows, and as a consequence of that, we sell an awful lot of plushy animals out of our uh, gift store, so that Candace. works Candace very nicely, great. yeah. <laughs> cool. Thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah, primarily nature documentaries, and uh, the only astronomy shows I've seen since I've started have been... Uh, library shows that can be requested by school groups, so they come up very specifically. All right, last call. Any more questions? Uh, Jeff, yeah. Cool. All right, um, I was intrigued by the IR um, exhibit because it seemed to be pretty popular. Uh, what was yes. that? IR definitely was a popular one. Uh, I think it pops up in this one. It's just, it's your standard infrared camera with uh, display. Um, I will say one of the nice twists that I've enjoyed from it is that Clark uh, does have some heated and cooled pads that guests can use to heat their hand and put symbol, cold symbols on their hands just to, to view with. Um, we do occasionally use the IR area as a facilitated presentation space as well, um, presenting with uh, a spatial tile that's heated to a super hot temperature and then displayed uh, displayed in front of the IR camera as well as visually to see the enormous temperature it was heated to and how little changed about it. All right, well, thanks so much, Nick. We'll get another round of applause for Nick and all of our presenters here in 3D.